Good afternoon. Bowden is present. Wow. Hi, David. Good afternoon. I'm going to follow this ridiculous protocol of starting at uh, 435, five minutes past the announced time, so that people have a chance to move their Zoom connection from one classroom to the next. Um, for, for me, this actually takes more like 40 minutes, but um, I have fewer commitments than the students. I'm going to go ahead and, and see if I can uh, share my screen properly. Um, and so good. Um, Oh, uh, so that didn't work. Uh, let, let's try it again. Um, 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 um. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So you see that one of the things I failed to do today was to change the header page on on the slides. There there was an AMS sectional meeting scheduled at Tufts uh, ten days ago. And th this talk was supposed to be given there. And the, of course, the meeting didn't take place. So I, I hate to throw away slides. OK, so I'm going to begin. Uh, so what, what I'm going to talk about is no potent conjugacy classes. I'm, particularly interested in the case of real reductive groups, but uh, I, I want to talk about Lustig's definition of special uh, nilpotence, which has to do with groups over many other fields, so that's going to come up. What I'm interested in is the relationship between nilpotent, uh, well, coadjoint orbits and representations of the group. And, you know, it's an old idea of Kostin that there is some connection for real reductive groups between uh, coadjoint orbits and representations. And what I want to, what, what interests me the most about what I'm discussing today is what Lustig's notion of special has to do with Kostin's old ideas. So, so I, I haven't actually read these slides for a few weeks, so it'll be a surprise for both of us. So uh, G of R being a real reductive algebraic group is not a big surprise. Um, and a good example to keep in mind is the, the real symplectic group. 
uh, I, I am, as I say, interested in irreducible representations of such a group. Um, an example is the symplectic group acts on R2n, so it acts on the real projective space Rp2n minus 1. And if you want to get a unitary representation, you can look at the space of square integrable half densities on, on that manifold. And that's an irreducible unitary representation. So as I say, I'm interested in the connection between representations and coadjoint orbits. And I'm going to talk about that using Roger Howe's idea, which I'll recall, of the wavefront set of a representation. It's one of the most basic invariants of the representation you could imagine. What I'll explain, so I'm writing a German G of R for the Lie algebra of uh, the group G, and the star means the, the real dual vector space. So Howe's wavefront set sits in that real dual vector space, and well, the group G of R acts on this vector space, and the wavefront set is invariant under that action, and it's a cone. In particular, in the example that I mentioned of half densities, um, this house wavefront set consists of all the nilpotent symplectic matrices of rank at most two. Um, so it well, I I would love to have a a pen to to make notes on this, but if you think about no potence in classical groups in terms of partitions, the partition for this, these no potence is two parts of size two and then two n minus four parts of size one. If, if you take uh, a generic irreducible representation of the symplectic group, so generic in the sense of automorphic forms or just in the uh, usual sense of typical, then the wavefront set consists of all nilpotent symplectic matrices. What, what's going on is that this wavefront set encodes interesting information about the representation. So another uh, old theorem of constant is that the group action, uh, the, this G of R action on, on the dual of the Lie algebra has a finite number of nilpotent orbits. And Hal showed that this wavefront set that he defined is a finite union of those nilpotent orbits. What I am going to focus on a little bit today is a result that, that comes uh, from various things that George Lustig did in the 1980s, that if the representation of the symplectic group is integral in a sense that I'll explain, then the wavefront set is not a random nilpotent orbit, but, uh, well, uh, when, when I say the wavefront set is special, what I mean is that it's the closure of some special nilpotent orbits. Um, so this, well, th this slide is, it, it's sort of telling you all the things that I need to explain in, in this talk. So you're not supposed to understand everything that I wrote here. Well, when I say you're not supposed to understand everything, you should bear in mind that this talk was written for the meeting at Tufts. And one of the things that I knew about that meeting was that George wouldn't be there. And, and so uh, 
some of you are supposed to understand all of this, but not all of you. So I'll try to explain what, what the words on this slide mean. So um, the, the first thing is, is Hal's wavefront set. So this, I'll talk about it just for Lie groups. I mean, I've sort of written a real reductive group, but uh, could to some extent be any, any Lie group. And Hal takes an, well, it doesn't even have to be irreducible for Hal, uh, a, a nice representation on a Hilbert space. And he defines a wavefront set uh, inside the dual of the Lie algebra. And the summary of the construction is that it's soft analysis. So he, here's a few more words. If you have a Hilbert space and a trace class operator on the Hilbert space, then to each trace class operator, you can define a, a matrix coefficient, which is the distribution on the group. And a distribution on the group has by, uh, I'm not sure to whom it should be attributed, uh, this little red squiggle here. Uh, I learned about these things from Victor Gilliman and, and read about them in Hermander's books on partial differential equations, volume one. Um, but at any rate, this, this notion of wavefront set of a distribution. Um, and what Howe's wavefront set is, is, is you take all these wavefront sets of matrix coefficients and you take their union and close them up. And that's the wavefront set of um, the, the representation. And what Howe explains for, for how you should control this wavefront set is, well, in the case of an irreducible representation, if you have an element of the center of the enveloping algebra, then it acts on this irreducible representation by a scalar. And that statement that the element acts uh, on the representation by a scalar translates into a differential equation for this matrix coefficient distribution. The, well, I've written pi of z, uh, ah, sorry, the, the z here, uh, the, the Z, it's in the enveloping algebra, and so I'm thinking of it as a differential operator on, on the group. Um, so if I apply that differential operator, well, the, it says the, this matrix coefficient is an eigenfunction uh, for that differential operator. And uh, as a consequence of the, the soft analysis results in Harmander's book, it follows that the the wavefront set of that distribution has to be contained in the zeros of the symbol of Z. Uh, David, can I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, so uh, do I understand correctly that this uh, uh, distribution uh, by T of uh, test function phi is, mm -hmm. is the trace of uh, uh, the phi composed with T? Yes. Mm -hmm. And also, in this wavefront set, is it uh, closely related to what is called singular support for D modules? Uh, e close is a strong term. Um, it, it's, it's not a simple relationship. There, there are, there, there's a really deep and complicated paper by Schmidt and Valonen in the 1990s, which establishes a, a very precise relationship between the wavefront set and the, well, the, I mean, the singular support for a D module is somewhat more complicated. It, it's spread out over the whole flag manifold. Uh, but Schmidt and Valonen explain how if you know the singular support for the D module, then you can compute the wavefront set in this sense. Um, it's, well, it's tricky because uh, 
in the D module picture, typically you're talking about Harishandra modules and things are equivariant for the complexification of a maximal compact. In the Howe's definition, things are equivariant for the full real group. And this is a kind of standard thing in the theory that, uh, I mean, starting with Cartan, the, there's nice relationships between those two settings, but really to relate this uh, distribution theoretic wave front set and, and the G of R orbits to the uh, D module singular support and, and complexification of K orbits, that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing, but, but that's what Schmidt and Bologna did. Um, so yes is the answer to your question. Um, uh, okay, so uh, th these central elements in the enveloping algebra, their symbols are exactly the homogeneous polynomials in the invariance of the symmetric algebra. And this cone of nilpotent elements in the dual of the Lie algebra can be defined in, in this way. It, it's the set of common zeros of all the, well, homogeneous polynomials of positive degree. Um, so this half of the slide is, is a pretty complete and detailed outline of how you prove that the wavefront set is contained in this snowpotent cone. So this is in, in Howe's original paper. It's a great paper and uh, you should read it. Okay. Um, so the, what I wanna talk about next is what, um, well, what the orbits of this real group on, on the nilpotent cone are. Um, so I'm interested in, in describing this wavefront set and that means figuring out which, which nilpotent orbits belong to the wavefront set. And that means figuring out how to list the nilpotent orbits. So if you take uh, the, the most split maximal torus in G um, and look at the lattice of co-characters, um, ah, so, I, I'm using this X lower star notation in a slightly odd way. I forget what the H is supposed to stand for, but um, I, I mean, of course, if you have a complex torus, this X lower star of the complex torus is the algebraic maps from C cross into the complex torus. But here, I, I just wanna look at those algebraic maps that are defined over R. So uh, th this it, it's a it, it's a sub lattice of the usual co-character lattice of the complex torus. Anyway, if you have one of these co-characters, it defines a, a Z grading of the Lie algebra uh, according to the weights of the uh, well of the co-character. Um, and so in, in particular, the zeroth level uh, of the, uh, of the grading is a real Levy subgroup. Uh, I mean, this is a Levy subgroup of a real parabolic. Um, and uh, according to very general results, which I don't know, I, I saw them in Vinberg from long ago, uh, this Levy subgroup has open orbits on each non-zero level of the grading. Um, and uh, more or less what's true is that if you have a real nilpotent orbit, then you can find one of these special co-characters 
with the property that first the orbit meets level two of the grading in an open set. And second, this co-character, well, if I regard the co-character as, as an element of the, the real Lie algebra, it belongs to, to the bracket of the two level and the minus two level of the grading. Um, so th this map from the orbit to, to the co-character uh, is, is well-defined up to the action of the vial group. And in this way, you get a finite to one map from these nilpotent orbits to uh, certain dominant uh, co-weights. And uh, let's, I'm, I'm trying to, um, um, uh, well, uh, anyway, uh, the bottom of my screen was obscured by the uh, pictures of people. So I, I moved the pictures of people. I'm not probably on your screen it wasn't obscured but who knows um so uh if you take the the dominant co-weight that you get in this way uh that's called the dinkin diagram of, of the orbit um what what happens is this dominant co-weight defines Take, takes a, a non-negative integer value at each simple root. And it turns out that value is zero, one, or two. And the way people write these orbits is by writing the Dinkin diagram of the group and putting a zero, one, or a two on each vertex. And then uh, the statement is that if once you've put a zero, one, or two on each vertex, then there's a finite number, possibly zero, of nilpotent orbits with that Dinkin diagram. Okay. Um, uh, why, why won't this? Ah, uh, I, I need to move my uh, my pictures of you again. Uh, Uh, so I want to say something about the structure of one of these orbits. So as I said, you, you've got this co-character, this map from R cross into uh, the, well, into the real group. Uh, and then the, this level two grading, this is the places where this R cross acts by squaring. Um, and that that's a vector subspace, and the the orbit is meets that vector subspace in an open set. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just wrote again the the definitions of the levels of, of the grading, uh, and ah, uh, this thing which I stated which I said aloud on the previous slide that uh, the Dinkin diagram on each simple root uh, takes the value zero, one, or two. And so that partitions the, the simple roots. You've got the ones where it's zero, the ones where it's one, and the ones where it's two. And this Levy subgroup that I mentioned, uh, that's the centralizer of D. Of course, that corresponds to the vertices in the Dinkin diagram the simple roots where uh, alpha takes the value zero. Um, the, the minus one uh, weight space is a sum of irreducible representations of this Levy subgroup. The highest weights of those irreducible representations are the negatives of the simple roots on which D takes the value one. 
I, I should really have drawn uh, an example or three of this. Um, actually, part of the problem is that this was meant to be a 20 minute talk at Tufts. And, and so uh, it was important not to give a lot of examples. Uh, David, can I ask a brief Of course. Question? I'm kind of ashamed to, to ask, but can you remind what is the connection between this story over complex numbers and over real numbers in terms of combinatorics of these diagrams, what you get? It's exactly the same over the complex numbers. Uh, so uh, I, I, the group is not split, is it? Or the group is not split. Uh, the The point is, if you have the point is, if there is a non-zero nilpotent element, the group has to have some split part, and and so you, you've you've got um, this map of R cross into the group. Uh, the the you know you don't have a whole rank of g uh family of commuting r crosses but you've got some and the nilpotent orbit ha has to correspond to some of those that survive so in, in the complex case i mean of course you you can choose any zeros ones and twos and and get a a, a dominant co-character and it's still the case not all of those will define nilpotents but um this open orbit bit in the complex case i mean it's a zariski open set so it has to be dense so in the complex case there's only one nilpotent for one of these diagrams um so it, it for for classical groups a, a nilpotent in a classical group acting on an n-dimensional space, the, the nilpotent corresponds to a certain partition of n. And, and this uh, diagram with the zeros, ones, and twos is telling you exactly what that partition is. Um, the partition in the case of a real group isn't quite enough to tell you which nilpotent it is. That there are some quadratic forms that you have to worry about what signature to use and things like that. Um, but you know, I, I don't know if that's sort of an answer to your question. Yeah. So so basically, what you're saying is that uh, is, is did I understand correctly that you, you have a, a certain collection of D's which correspond to orbits for the complex group and then for the real groups. Uh, there are finitely many, possibly zero orbits corresponding to that diagram. Yeah. That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. And that correct. classifies them. Okay. That, that's, well, I mean, since I've told you nothing about how to tell how many such, such uh, nilpotents there are for the complex one, it, it's, that's not a very successful classification, but right. no. it, it's yeah. good enough for what, what I'm interested in is singling out this notion of special nilpotent. Okay. And the, if you have a special complex orbit, all the real forms will be special. So uh, this is good enough for our purposes. Okay. So, um, so, so now I, I, I want to take some representative of uh, my nilpotent orbit in this level two uh, eigenspace. And I want to understand the isotropy group for that nilpotent. I mean, of course, the orbit is a homogeneous space. The orbit is G divided by G upper lambda. So understanding the orbit partly means understanding the homogeneous space. Um, so, so here's the structure of the isotropy group. Um, it, th this G upper D is the Levy subgroup. And so, and, uh, and, and well, I, I skipped over this parabolic subgroup that's defined by the co-character. Um, what happens is that uh, the, the stabilizer of, of this nilpotent element respects that Levy decomposition of the parabolic. So it's the product of these two pieces. 
Um, and let's see how I, um, uh, okay. Um, um, and uh, th this unipotent piece, well, this, this U upper lambda, this is a unipotent, connected unipotent subgroup. And so to know what it is, you just have to know what the Lie algebra is. Uh, and that's, that unipotent group is graded uh, by the same, uh, by, by the eigenvalues of D. You have a bunch of positive eigenspaces. And all these de decompositions are defined over the reals. Okay. So, uh, uh, now I, I want to recall how a coadjoint orbit gets to be uh, a symplectic mm -hmm. manifold. So, so this is, is the, these first few lines are, are just um, what I said on the previous slide that, that I'm I've got this nice co-character which gives a grading of the Lie algebra and I, I'm taking this nilpotent element in the level two of the grading and then the tangent space to this coadjoint orbit is the quotient of the Lie algebra by this isotropy group and here's what it is. Uh, you, Everything, the isotropy group is graded by D, so, so this uh, tangent space inherits the, the grading. The, the minus one level is, is the full minus one level of coming from, from the group. Then the other levels come in pairs. Uh, the, the negative levels, the minus two, minus three, and so on, there's, there's nothing centralizing the nilpotent in there. And they come with a positive, well, anyway, th this is the way I choose to, to write uh, the decomposition. And the coadjoint orbit has this, a uh, symplectic form, uh, which it's a very general thing about coadjoint orbits. There's the definition. You, you apply the linear functional to the bracket of two Lie algebra elements. Um, and what happens is this decomposition that I've written up above is a symplectic decomposition. This uh, GD of minus one is a symplectic submanifold. The, the uh, form is non-degenerate there. And these pairs of spaces, each of them is identified with the dual of the other uh, using the form. Um, okay. Uh, this form is a key part of how you're supposed to relate the nilpotent orbit to representation theory. And what I'm more or less, well, the, the theorem uh, in this talk uh, is a conjecture of Meinolf Geck, uh, which is that an orbit is, oh, this was, the, uh, I, I just mistyped. Uh, th this is meant to be a, a, a calligraphic O. Um, the, the orbit is special if and only if this symplectic form is integral in, in a sense that Geck defined, which I'll explain. Um, so uh, that, that's, I, I found this a really wonderful conjecture, well, when George pointed it out to me because he correctly understood that I would find it to be a really wonderful conjecture. So what's integral mean? 
so to talk about an integral structure on the orbit, first need to talk about an integral structure on the Lie algebra. So if you've got an n-dimensional Lie algebra over a characteristic zero field, little k, then an integral structure is a, a free, well, I guess the word free is, uh, I can't even remember what the superfluous anyway. Um, uh, a, a, a rank n lattice g sub z inside g and what you require about this lattice is that if you extend scalars to the field uh, you, you get the Lie algebra and the, this lattice should be closed under Lie bracket. So a, an equivalent way to say that is that you can find a basis uh, with the property that the structure constants in the basis are integers. So uh, here, here's an example in SL2, the everybody's, or well, it, it ought to be everybody's favorite basis of SL2, uh, consisting of this diagonal matrix, uh, upper triangular and lower triangular. Here are the bracket relations, and of course the structure constants two minus two and one are integers. So here's another example, which is kind of completely different. Um, I, I suppose, well, maybe this one is famous because of Dirac. I'm, I'm not, I'm sure it goes back further than that. Anyway, this is a basis of SO3. Uh, the, these three uh, matrices and the bracket relations uh, are even better. The, the, there aren't these nasty twos, it's just all ones. The, this, this looks really good. Um, okay, uh, so that's some examples of integral structures. Um, and Chevalet uh, proved a theorem that, that if you have a complex reductive Lie algebra with roots and co-roots, uh, Chevalet, well, the integral structures that Chevalet talked about were split, and here's the definition of a split integral structure. So the first thing is that you've got an integer basis of the Cartan subalgebra, uh, and for each root, you have a root vector for that root. So I, I, I didn't make it clear that that was a, a hypothesis. So, I mean, of course you can make a basis for the Lie algebra by choosing a basis of the Cartan and one root vector for each root, but the, the requirement is that that's an integral basis, that uh, the, roots should take integer values on these xi's and that the uh, bracket of any two, well, that it's an integral structure. And the, the second requirement is that if you bracket the root vector for alpha with the root vector for minus alpha, you get the co-root uh, for alpha. Um, so in particular, this, this co-root is required to be part of your integral structure, uh, not, not necessarily one of the basis vectors, but in the integer span of these basis vectors. Um, so what Chevalet proved is that if you have a split integral structure like this, the set of root vectors that you get is up to sign uniquely determined, well, up to sign and, and the adjoint action of the torus. So it, it's essentially a unique thing. Um, uh, the X alphas are, are unique. And furthermore, in, in this split integral structure, the, this integer stuff in, in the Cartan is caught between the span of the co-roots and the uh, integral co-weights. 
And any lattice that you get, which is between those two places, is a split integral structure on, on G. Um, uh, well, okay. Um, so if, um, ah, so in the semi-simple case, uh, there's one of these possibilities is, is that on the Cartan, you choose the Z span of the co-roots and that integral structure is the one which Chevalet uh, found. That's the Chevalet integral structure. Okay. So, well, I mean, of course, what Chevalet was doing with this was uh, making groups over uh, arbitrary fields. But I'm going to set that aside. Um, so, ah, we're interested in the dual of the Lie algebra, but an integral structure on the Lie algebra defines in a natural way an integer, an integral structure on the dual of the Lie algebra. I mean, the dual consists of linear maps from G to R, and you can require that those linear maps take the integer lattice into Z, and that defines a lattice inside G star. So uh, I'm going to say that um, a coadjoint orbit, any coadjoint orbit, is called weakly integral if it meets this integral lattice uh, in, in the dual. So every nilpotent orbit has that property. I, I, I'm not. I'm not proving that, but it's, it's a very easy fact. Ah, well, so maybe I am proving it. Uh, uh, well, so what it means, the, this element D, uh, for the null potent is automatically in the co-root lattice and therefore uh, in the integral structure. Uh, and, and the statement, well, the statement is that you can find something in this level two eigenspace, which is an integral element. Um, and what that means is you, you need it, you need the value that this lambda takes on each level two root to be an integer. Uh, and in that way, you get a, 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 a representative that's in this G star Z. OK, once you've chosen uh, uh, this, this integral representative, the symplectic form becomes uh, uh, well, the, the symplectic form is integer valued. Um, I mean, it, it defines an inclusion of these integer points into these integer points. And what happens is, is that the fact that the symplectic form is non-degenerate over R implies, I mean, these are, the, this thing here is a lattice. And this is the dual lattice. These are two lattices of the same rank. And the non-degeneracy of R means that this map is injective. And so you have an injective map between two lattices of the same rank, follows that the image has finite index. Um, so the, how do I say it? The, this, um, let, let me uh, go back to the weight space. Ah, th this decomposition of, of the tangent space. Th there's this minus one level 
and then there are these other more boring levels. Uh, and what, what I, I want to say is that this integral structure respects that decomposition um, you get from, from this map on the whole Lie algebra up here, you get all these pieces and each, at, at each level, you've got a, an injection from a lattice into another lattice of the same rank. Uh, and each, so each one of these maps has, the image has finite index and, and this N lambda is the product of, well, the indices for, for these things and the index for this symplectic form here. Okay, so I, I wanna say that my lambda is strongly integral if uh, this number n lambda is one. In other words, that this integral symplectic form is non-degenerate over the integers. Non-degeneracy, oh, well, I, I have this product formula for, for uh, the n lambda. And so non-degeneracy means that every one of these factors has to be non-degenerate. So Geck's definition of integral is just about this minus one eigenspace. It's just about this level here. Geck wants this symplectic form to be non-degenerate over Z. So that's a Geck integral is a weaker condition than strongly integral. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to set aside integrality for a minute and talk about uh, George's notion of special. So George's notion starts out in the vial group. Uh, so if we have this uh, G, uh, th there's a Chevalet group over any finite field which has a Borel subgroup over the finite field. Uh, and one of the oldest facts about representation theory for this finite Chevalet group is that there's a bijection between irreducible representations of the vial group and irreducible representations of this finite Chevalet group, which contain a fixed vector for the Borel subgroup. So I, I'm going to write sigma for a representation of the vial group. And th this representation, the finite Chevalet group, just depends on the prime power Q. So I'll write pi Q of sigma for, for that representation of G of F Q. So the trivial representation of the vial group corresponds to the trivial representation of G of F Q. And the sign representation of the vial group corresponds to the Steinberg representation of G of F Q. So attached to this vial group representation, well, you, you can then take the dimension of, of this representation of the finite Chevalet group. And it turns out that the dimension of the finite Chevalet group representation is a polynomial in this prime power Q with rational coefficients. And that polynomial is, is called the generic degree for, for the uh, vial group representation. Uh, there's something else that you can do. Uh, if you look at the complex group, this uh, comp uh, the, this flag variety is a projective variety with cohomology only in even degrees. The, the vial group acts on the cohomology of the flag variety. And in fact, it acts by the regular representation of W. And the action is graded. And, and so attached, well, each representation of the vial group 
appears in, in this cohomology in various degrees. So you can make a polynomial by looking at the multiplicity in degree 2i and multiplying by q to the i. So you get a polynomial in q with non-negative integer coefficients. And the value of this polynomial at 1 is the dimension of sigma. And George uh, called this polynomial the fake degree. It's interesting because in the case of GLN, the fake degree and the generic degree are exactly the same. And for other groups, they have an interesting relation. So I want to define two numbers for each vial group representation. You, you might think you should define the degree of these polynomials, but instead of the degree, I want to look at the lowest power of Q that appears in, in each polynomial. So A tilde sigma is the lowest power of Q that appears in P tilde, this uh, thing about finite Chevalier groups, and A sigma is the least power of Q that appears in P sigma. So L Lustig showed in 1979 that there's an inequality. As I say, for, for this symmetric group and GLN, these two polynomials are the same, the two degrees are the same. What Lustig showed in 79 was that there's always an inequality, that this, this uh, number coming from the fake degree, sorry, the number coming from the generic degree is always smaller than the number coming from uh, the fake degree. And he defined the vial group representation to be special if equality holds. So for the symmetric group, every vial group representation is special. Okay. Um, so Springer in 1978 made an inclusion uh, th this is in an algebraically closed field. Uh, an inclusion, uh, well, what's written here should probably be characteristic zero, from nilpotent orbits in the dual of the Lie algebra to irreducible representations of the vial group. So I'll write that sending an orbit to J of the orbit. And it's very easy to relate Springer's inclusion to the fake degree. Here's the relationship. If R is the number of positive roots, then the dimension of the orbit is 2R minus two times the fake degree. So I, well, I should say, if the, ah, well, if the orbit, is principal, then Springer's J of, J of O is the trivial representation. And the trivial representation of the vial group appears only in degree zero. The, the fake degree is the constant polynomial one. And so this A tilde is zero. Uh, the dimension of the principal orbit is twice the number of roots. He also defined a surjection, a uh, one-sided inverse to, to this J, going from vial group representations to nilpotent orbits. And uh, what's true about this surjection is uh, an inequality, that if you have a vial group representation uh, and you make a nilpotent orbit out of it, uh, then the dimension of that nilpotent orbit is greater than or equal to this number uh, of appearing up, up here. And the equality of these two things tells you uh, whether you're in the image of J. So, so I said P composed with J is the identity. It's a one-sided inverse. So J composed with P is the identity on the image of J. So 
this this is describing the image of J. Uh, so Kajdanlistic theory partitions representations of the vial group in what Kajdanlistic called families or, or two-sided cells. And here's Lustig's theorem about that. Every family of vial group representations has a unique special representation inside it. This uh, number A tilde sub sigma coming from the uh, generic degrees is constant on each family. Uh, did I get the generic? No. Um, um, um. Okay. Sorry, this A tilde is coming from generic degrees. I forget what I said, but um, anyway, that's constant over the family. The number coming from fake degree, yes? I think the A tilde, so on this slide, um, uh, the third line, the, the A tilde there should be A. A, yes, it absolutely should be. Bo both of these both A tildes them. should be A's. I, I'm sorry. That's okay. absolutely correct. Sorry. Um, yeah, the, the, the point of what I was writing up here was this was a statement uh, about fake degrees which was parallel to Lustig's statement about generic degrees. Um, and I got it backwards. Uh, so, so up here, these should be A's. Uh, and I, I'm going to post these slides on the seminar web page, and I will fix that. Th thank you. Um, OK, so um, the this fake degree, uh, it's it's always bigger than this generic degree, and equality happens exactly once uh, on, on the family at the special representation. And um, the, this special representation is, well, because of Springer's description up here, that tells you that a special representation has to be in uh, the image of, of the Springer correspondence. Okay, um, so that's Lustig's definition of special. Um, and here's um, what, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm recalling uh, the the in any Nopotan orbit, you could find this weakly integral thing and uh, then I, I said there was this notion of GEC integral, which was that the symplectic form on the minus one weight space was non-degenerate over the integers. And GEC conjectured that a nilpotent orbit is special if and only if this representative can be chosen to be GEC integral. So, Geck proved this by hard computation in the exceptional groups um, and published the conjecture. And then Dong and Yang, uh, the following year, uh, well, also, also Geck proved it for classical groups up to rank, uh, I forget, 10 or 15, something like that. Uh, but it's a hard computation. And Dong and Yang uh, carried it out for all classical groups. It, it's a case by case proof using the known list of special nilpotents. That it that there's never anything that says the definition of special is this, and therefore the proof is entirely the list of special nilpotents in type C is this, and we'll calculate these determinants in type C and see that we can get one. Um, so remember I said that 
Gek's integrality, which was just on this minus one eigenspace, was weaker than the hypothesis that I called strongly integral, which is that this whole symplectic form was integral. And I, I don't want to elevate this to a conjecture because I haven't done enough work, but what I hope is that uh, the Geck integrality condition implies strongly integral. I mean, it's certainly not true that if you have a representative that's Geck integral, then it's automatically strongly integral. That's false. But uh, what I hope is that you can arrange most of the strongly integral condition sort of in a routine fashion. And uh, then all the hard work is on this uh, minus one weight space. I, I'll just flash back to uh, the, that decomposition. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, the symplectic form is built from one interesting symplectic form and then a bunch of places where you're pairing uh, a lattice with a dual lattice. And so what I hope is that the integrality, well, the non-degeneracy, the, the making all these maps and isomor isomorphisms might be something that you can just do by hand uh, in some easy fashion. And, and it's only this honest symplectic form where you have to think hard about how to get a basis and it's hard. Um, anyway, so, so if I go back to uh, the, this Gek, um, yeah, so uh, that's, uh, that's the story. And uh, I hope I made another slide. Uh, oh, yes. Ah, yes, right. Uh, I made two more slides. So uh, this is the reason that I care about uh, these definitions, that if you have an irreducible representation, the infinitesimal character of the representation is by Harishandra given by a linear functional on the Cartan. And what I want is to assume that linear functional on the Cartan is an integral co-weight. Um, well, sorry, an integral weight. A and then what Lustig proved is that if you have that integrality assumption, then there's a special no potent orbit so that the wavefront set is the closure of certain real forms of that orbit. Um, so, uh, I mean, Dan Barbash and I uh, put the, the word real into this. We, we, you know, used a lot of deep results of George and uh, some things that we already knew about real groups. Um, so the conclusion is that Lustig's notion of special is closely tied to integrality properties of representations. And what the reason for this talk was to hope that there was a conceptual way to prove that if, the, if you have a, a representation of integral infinitesimal character, that the wavefront set is strongly integral in, in this sense. Um, um, and well, that would, the, the proof of Lustig's theorem up here is, is mostly conceptual. It's not case by case. And, and so, uh, more or less, you would get a conceptual proof that a special orbit had to be strongly integral 
which, as I said, implies Geck integral, and that's half of Geck's conjecture. And in order to, to do this, what you would need to do is study nice integer forms of representations with integral infinitesimal character. Um, and, you, you know, in, in this Berkhoiser book about representations of real reductive groups, uh, I, I wrote bases for representations of SL2R uh, of integral infinitesimal character uh, in the block of a finite dimensional. And <clears throat> so the, the next thing to do would be to look at other blocks of integral infinitesimal character. I mean, I wrote down bases for those also, but the bases that I wrote are not integral. Um, so I think that's the end of the talk. Yes. Uh, any questions? Can, can you hear? Uh, yes, I can hear. Thank you. Yeah, so, so you, uh, in abstract, abstract, you said that the special reputations uh, appear in the reputation of lo over local fields. So I don't, so where, how do they appear, how do they appear for periodic? I, I um, mean, that they appear for periodic. So um, well, let's see if I can make this go back. Um, If you look at your classification of unramified representations, or yeah, um, that has a on the dual group side a semi-simple element and a unipotent element and some other stuff, um, and if the semi-simple element is trivial, uh, that's a particularly interesting class of, of representations for the piatic group. It's my belief that if you write down Howe's wavefront set for any one of those representations, it will have to be composed of special, I mean, it'll be the closure of a special nilpotent orbit. Um, that's, I don't know that that's proved, but I, I think that it it should be true. Um, so, um, yeah, that that that's a kind of connection. Um, and there's something. Well, I, I know even less well how to make a correct statement uh, for finite Chevalier groups, uh, but. I mean, you have various ways of attaching uh, nilpotence in the, well, unipotence in, in the group to uh, representations. And it, is it the case that what you attach to, spe to unipotent representations is uh, special nilpotence? Yes. yes. Okay, so th that's another that's a statement which gets inherited by local fields also. Uh, okay. Other comments? But we'll find that there, 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 are two, there are two ways to attach. I don't know which one you, this, there are a lot of duality. And so there are two, two ways. But one, of them, one of them is called wave front set and the other one is called support. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, um, uh, well, I, I don't know which um, one one should use. Um, I, I'm, I'm, ah, oh good, I, I was trying to look up the speaker for next week. Um, I believe that Carl Mautner from Dartmouth is going to speak from Dartmouth. Um, I'll, I'll Put up the details on the website. Well, I, I thought it was. I thought the website showed that is Deshpande. No, is that not not correct? Uh, 
next week. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was uh, the website does say Deshpanda. Yes, uh, and uh, I I can't remember whether he sent me an abstract yet, but Deshpanda yeah, is yeah. going to speak next week. Yeah, there's an abstract on on on, on your website. Oh, good, good, good. Uh, 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 oh, oh, I know what the problem is. Uh, I, I was looking at my iPhone, which uh, had a cached copy of of the Lee Groups page. And in, in the old, anyway, yes. So Deshpanda will speak next week on character sheaves on algebraic groups. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat>